Hello, and welcome back to Obsidian River Productions. Today, we're continuing our delightful journey through Louisa May Alcott's beloved novel, Little Women. In this episode, we immerse ourselves in the captivating world of chapters 10, 11, and 12, where the March sisters' experiences bring new adventures and insights. In chapter 10, the PC and PO were introduced to the joys and trials of the March sisters' secret clubs. This chapter is filled with the warmth of sisterhood and the charm of their imaginative worlds. It's a heartwarming glimpse into the simple yet profound joys of their daily lives. Chapter 11, Experiments, takes a turn towards the challenges of self-improvement. The sisters embark on a unique experiment to overcome their personal flaws. It's a chapter that's both humorous and reflective, highlighting the universal journey of personal growth. And in Chapter 12, Camp Lawrence, we join the March sisters in a delightful outdoor excursion. This chapter is a vivid portrayal of friendship, leisure, and the beauty of nature, showcasing Alcott's skill in bringing everyday moments to life with her vivid storytelling. As we explore these chapters, we're reminded of the timeless nature of Alcott's work. Her characters and their stories continue to resonate with readers of all ages. And here's a special treat for you, our listeners, Head over to obsidianriver.com slash gift to download a free audiobook. It's our way of saying thank you for joining us on this literary adventure. So settle in, hit that subscribe button, and let's dive into the charming and insightful world of the March Sisters in Little Women. 10. The PC and PO As spring came on, a new set of amusements became the fashion, and the lengthening days gave long afternoons for work and play of all sorts. The garden had to be put in order, and each sister had a quarter of the little plot to do what she liked with. Hannah used to say, I'd know which each of them gardings belonged to, E.F. I see them in Chinese. And so she might, for the girls' tastes differed as much as their characters. Meg's had roses and heliotrope, myrtle, and a little orange tree in it. Joe's bed was never alike two seasons, for she was always trying experiments. This year, it was to be a plantation of sunflowers, the seeds of which cheerful and aspiring plant were to feed Aunt Cockletop and her family of chicks. Beth had old-fashioned, fragrant flowers in her garden. Sweet peas and mignonette, larkspur, pinks, pansies, and southernwood, with chickweed for the bird and catnip for the pussies. Amy had a bower in hers, rather small and earwiggy, but very pretty to look at, with honeysuckles and morning glories hanging their colored horns and bells in graceful wreaths all over it, tall, white lilies, delicate ferns, and as many brilliant picturesque plants as would consent to blossom there. Gardening, walks, rows on the river, and flower hunts employed the fine days. And for rainy ones, they had house diversions, some old, some new, all more or less original. One of these was the PC. For, as secret societies were the fashion, it was thought proper to have one. And, as all of the girls admired Dickens, they called themselves the Pickwick Club. With a few interruptions, they had kept this up for a year and met every Saturday evening in the big garret, on which occasions the ceremonies were as follows. Three chairs were arranged in a row before a table, on which was a lamp, also four white badges, with a big PC in different colors on each, and the weekly newspaper, called the Pickwick Portfolio, to which all contributed something while Joe, who reveled in pens and ink, was the editor. At seven o'clock, the four members ascended to the club room, tied their badges round their heads, and took their seats with great solemnity. Meg, as the eldest, was Samuel Pickwick, Joe, being of a literary turn, Augustus Snodgrass, Beth, because she was round and rosy, Tracy Tupman, and Amy, who was always trying to do what she couldn't, was Nathaniel Winkle. Pickwick, the president, read the paper, which was filled with original tales, poetry, local news, funny advertisements, and hints, in which they good-naturedly reminded each other of their faults and shortcomings. On one occasion, Mr. Pickwick put on a pair of spectacles without any glasses, rapped upon the table, hemmed, and, having stared hard at Mr. Snodgrass, who was tilting back in his chair, till he arranged himself properly, began to read. The Pickwick Portfolio! May 20th, Poet's Corner, Anniversary Ode. Again, we meet to celebrate, with badge and solemn rite, 
our 52nd anniversary in Pickwick Hall tonight. We all are here in perfect health, none gone from our small band. Again, we see each well-known face and press each friendly hand. Our Pickwick, always at his post, with reverence we greet. As spectacles on nose, he reads our well-filled weekly sheet. Although he suffers from a cold, we joy to hear him speak, for words of wisdom from him fall, in spite of croak or squeak. Old six-foot snodgrass looms on high, with elephantine grace, and beams upon the company, with brown and jovial face. Poetic fire lights up his eye, he struggles gainst his lot. Behold ambition on his brow, and on his nose a blot. Next our peaceful Tupman comes, so rosy, plump, and sweet, who chokes with laughter at the puns, and tumbles off his seat. Prim little Winkle, too, is here, with every hair in place, a model of propriety, though he hates to wash his face. The year is gone, we still unite, to joke and laugh and read, and tread the path of literature that doth to glory lead. Long may our paper prosper well, our club unbroken be, and coming years their blessings pour on the useful gay PC. A. Snodgrass, The Masked Marriage, A Tale of Venice, Gondola after gondola swept up to the marble steps and left its lovely load to swell the brilliant throng that filled the stately halls of Count de Adelon. Knights and ladies, elves and pages, monks and flower girls, all mingled gaily in the dance. Sweet voices and rich melody filled the air. And so, with mirth and music, the masquerade went on. "'Has your highness seen the Lady Viola tonight?' asked a gallant troubadour of the fairy queen, who floated down the hall upon his arm. Yes, is she not lovely, though so sad? Her dress is well chosen, too, for in a week she weds Count Antonio, whom she passionately hates. By my faith, I envy him. Yonder he comes, arrayed like a bridegroom, except the black mask. When that is off, we shall see how he regards the fair maid whose heart he cannot win, though her stern father bestows her hand, returned the troubadour. Tis whispered that she loves the young English artist who haunts her steps, and is spurned by the old count, said the lady, as they joined the dance. The revel was at its height when a priest appeared, and, withdrawing the young pair to an alcove hung with purple velvet, he motioned them to kneel. Instant silence fell upon the gay throng, and not a sound, but the dash of fountains or the rustle of orange groves sleeping in the moonlight broke the hush as Count de Adelon spoke thus. My lords and ladies, Pardon the ruse by which I have gathered you here to witness the marriage of my daughter. Father, we wait your services. All eyes turned toward the bridal party, and a low murmur of amazement went through the throng, for neither bride nor groom removed their masks. Curiosity and wonder possessed all hearts, but respect restrained all tongues till the holy rite was over. Then the eager spectators gathered round the count, demanding an explanation. Gladly would I give it if I could, but I only know that it was the whim of my timid Viola, and I yielded to it. Now, my children, let the play end. Unmask and receive my blessing. But neither bent the knee, for the young bridegroom replied in a tone that startled all listeners as the mask fell, disclosing the noble face of Ferdinand Devereux, the artist lover. And, leaning on the breast, where now flashed the star of an English earl, was the lovely Viola, radiant with joy and beauty. My lord, you scornfully bade me claim your daughter when I could boast as high a name and vast a fortune as the Count Antonio. I can do more, for even your ambitious soul cannot refuse the Earl of Devereux and Devere when he gives his ancient name and boundless wealth in return for the beloved hand of this fair lady, now my wife. The Count stood like one changed to stone, and turning to the bewildered crowd, Ferdinand added, with a gay smile of triumph, To you, my gallant friends, I can only wish that your wooing may prosper as mine has done, and that you may all win as fair a bride as I have by this masked marriage. S. Pickwick Why is the PC like the Tower of Babel? It is full of unruly members. The History of a Squash Once upon a time, a farmer planted a little seed in his garden, and after a while it sprouted and became a vine and bore many squashes. One day in October, when they were ripe, he picked one and took it to market. A grocer man bought and put it in his shop. That same morning, 
A little girl, in a brown hat and blue dress, with a round face and snub nose, went and bought it for her mother. She lugged it home, cut it up, and boiled it in the big pot. Mashed some of it with salt and butter for dinner. And to the rest, she added a pint of milk, two eggs, four spoons of sugar, nutmeg, and some crackers. Put it in a deep dish and baked it till it was brown and nice, and next day it was eaten by a family named March. T. Toopman, Mr. Pickwick, sir. I address you upon the subject of sin the sinner I mean is a man named Winkle who makes trouble in his club by laughing and sometimes won't write his piece in this fine paper. I hope you will pardon his badness and let him send a French fable because he can't write out of his head as he has so many lessons to do and no brains in future. I will try to take time by the fetlock and prepare some work which will be all commis la faux. That means all right. I am in haste as it is nearly school time. Yours respectably, N. Winkle. The above is a manly and handsome acknowledgement of past misdemeanors. If our young friends studied punctuation, it would be well. A sad accident. On Friday last, we were startled by a violent shock in our basement, followed by cries of distress. On rushing, in a body, to the cellar, we discovered our beloved president prostrate upon the floor, having tripped and fallen while getting wood for domestic purposes. A perfect scene of ruin met our eyes, for in his fall, Mr. Pickwick had plunged his head and shoulders into a tub of water, upset a keg of soft soap upon his manly form, and torn his garments badly. On being removed from this perilous situation, it was discovered that he had suffered no injury but several bruises, and, we are happy to add, is now doing well. E.D. The Public Bereavement It is our painful duty to record the sudden and disappearance of our cherished friend, Mrs. Snowball Pat Paw. This lovely and beloved cat was the pet of a large circle of warm and admiring friends. For her beauty attracted all eyes, her graces and virtues endeared her to all hearts, and her loss is deeply felt by the whole community. When last seen, she was sitting at the gate, watching the butcher's cart, and it is feared that some villain, tempted by her charms, basely stole her. Weeks have passed, but no trace of her has been discovered, and we relinquish all hope, tie a black ribbon to her basket, set aside her dish, and weep for her as one lost to us forever. A sympathizing friend sends the following gem. A lament for S.B. Pat Paw. We mourn the loss of our little pet, and sigh o'er her hapless fate, for never more by the fire she'll sit, nor play by the old green gate. The little grave where her infant sleeps is neath the chestnut tree, but o'er her grave we may not weep, we know not where it may be. Her empty bed, her idle ball, we'll never see her more. No gentle tap, no loving purr is heard at the parlor door. Another cat comes after her mice, a cat with a dirty face but she does not hunt as our darling did, nor play with her airy grace. Her stealthy paws tread the very hall where Snowball used to play, but she only spits at the dogs our pet, so gallantly drove away. She is useful and mild and does her best, but she is not fair to see. And we cannot give her your place, dear, nor worship her as we worship thee. As advertisements, Miss Aranthe Bluggage, the accomplished strong-minded lecturer, will deliver her famous lecture on Woman and Her Position at Pickwick Hall next Saturday evening after the usual performances. A weekly meeting will be held at Kitchen Place to teach young ladies how to cook. Hannah Brown will preside, and all are invited to attend. The Dustpan Society will meet on Wednesday next and parade in the upper story of the clubhouse. All members to appear in uniform and shoulder their brooms at nine precisely. Mrs. Beth Bouncer will open her new assortment of dolls millinery next week. The latest Paris fashions have arrived, and orders are respectfully solicited. A new play will appear at the Barnville Theater in the course of a few weeks, which will surpass anything ever seen on the American stage. The Greek Slave, or Constantine the Avenger, is the name of this thrilling drama. Hints. If S.P. didn't use so much soap on his hands, he wouldn't always be late at breakfast as is requested not to whistle in the street. T.T., please don't forget Amy's napkin. N.W. must not fret because his dress has not nine tucks. Weekly report. Meg. Good. Joe. Bad. Beth. Very good. Amy. 
middling. As the president finished reading the paper, which I beg leave to assure my readers is a bona fide copy of one written by bona fide girls once upon a time. A round of applause followed, and then Mr. Snodgrass rose to make a proposition. Mr. President and gentlemen, he began, assuming a parliamentary attitude and tone, I wish to propose the admission of a new member, one who highly deserves the honor, would be deeply grateful for it, and would add immensely to the spirit of the club, the literary value of the paper, and be no end jolly and nice. I propose Mr. Theodore Lawrence as an honorary member of the PC. Come now, do have him. Joe's sudden change of tone made the girls laugh, but all looked rather anxious, and no one said a word, as Snodgrass took his seat. We'll put it to vote, said the president. All in favor of this motion, please to manifest it by saying, aye. A loud response from Snodgrass followed to everybody's surprise by a timid one from Beth. Contrary-minded say no. Meg and Amy were contrary-minded, and Mr. Winkle rose to say, with great elegance, We don't wish any boys. They only joke and bounce about. This is a ladies' club, and we wish to be private and proper. I'm afraid he'll laugh at our paper and make fun of us afterward, observed Pickwick, pulling the little curl on her forehead, as she always did when doubtful. Up rose Snodgrass, very much in earnest. Sir, I give you my word as a gentleman. Laurie won't do anything of the sort. He likes to write, and he'll give a tone to our contributions and keep us from being sentimental, don't you see? We can do so little for him, and he does so much for us. I think the least we can do is to offer him a place here and make him welcome if he comes. This artful allusion to benefits conferred brought Tupman to his feet, looking as if he had quite made up his mind. Yes, we ought to do it, even if we are afraid. I say he may come, and his grandpa too if he likes. This spirited burst from Beth electrified the club, and Joe left her seat to shake hands approvingly. Now then, vote again. Everybody remember it's our lorry, and say aye, cried Snodgrass excitedly. Aye, 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 replied three voices at once. Good, bless you. Now, as there's nothing like taking time by the fetlock, as Winkle characteristically observes, Allow me to present the new member. And, to the dismay of the rest of the club, Joe threw open the door of the closet and displayed Lori sitting on a rag bag, flushed and twinkling with suppressed laughter. You rogue! You traitor! Joe, how could you? cried the three girls, as Snodgrass led her friend triumphantly forth, and, producing both a chair and a badge, installed him in a jiffy. The coolness of you two rascals is amazing, began Mr. Pickwick trying to get up an awful frown, and only succeeding in producing an amiable smile. But the new member was equal to the occasion, and, rising, with a grateful salutation to the chair, said in the most engaging manner, Mr. President and ladies, I beg pardon, gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself as Sam Weller, the very humble servant of the club. Good, good, cried Joe, pounding with the handle of the old warming pan on which she leaned. My faithful friend and noble patron, continued Laurie with a wave of the hand, who has so flatteringly presented me, is not to be blamed for the base stratagem of tonight. I planned it, and she only gave in after lots of teasing. Come now, don't lay it all on yourself. You know I propose the cupboard, broke in Snodgrass, who was enjoying the joke amazingly. Never you mind what she says. I'm the wretch that did it, sir, said the new member with a Welleresque nod to Mr. Pickwick but on my honor, I never will do so again, and henceforth devote myself to the interest of this immortal club. Here! Here! cried Joe, clashing the lid of the warming pan like a cymbal. Go on, go on! added Winkle and Tupman, while the president bowed benignly. I merely wish to say that as a slight token of my gratitude for the honor done me, and as a means of promoting friendly relations between adjoining nations, I have set up a post office in the hedge in the lower corner of the garden, a fine, spacious building with padlocks on the doors and every convenience for the males, also the females, if I may be allowed the expression. It's the old Martin house, but I've stopped up the door and made the roof open so it will hold all sorts of things and save our valuable time. Letters, manuscripts, books, and bundles can be passed in there, and as each nation has a key, it will be uncommonly nice, I fancy. Allow me to present the club key, and with many thanks for your favor, take my seat.
Great applause as Mr. Weller deposited a little key on the table and subsided. The warming pan clashed and waved wildly, and it was some time before order could be restored. A long discussion followed, and everyone came out surprising, for everyone did her best. So it was an unusually lively meeting, and did not adjourn till a late hour when it broke up with three shrill cheers for the new member. No one ever regretted the admittance of Sam Weller, for a more devoted, well-behaved, and jovial member no club could have. He certainly did add spirit to the meetings, and a tone to the paper, for his orations convulsed his hearers, and his contributions were excellent, being patriotic, classical, comical, or dramatic, but never sentimental. Joe regarded them as worthy of Bacon, Milton, or Shakespeare, and remodeled her own works with good effect, she thought. The P.O. was a capital little institution, and flourished wonderfully, for nearly as many queer things passed through it as through the real office. Tragedies and cravats, poetry and pickles, garden seeds and long letters, music and gingerbread, rubbers, invitations, scoldings and puppies. The old gentleman liked the fun, and amused himself by sending odd bundles, mysterious messages, and funny telegrams. And his gardener, who was smitten with Hannah's charms, actually sent a love letter to Joe's care. How they laughed when the secret came out, never dreaming how many love letters that little post office would hold in the years to come. 11. Experiments The first of June. The kings are off to the seashore tomorrow, and I'm free. Three months vacation. How I shall enjoy it! exclaimed Meg, coming home one warm day to find Joe laid upon the sofa in an unusual state of exhaustion, while Beth took off her dusty boots, and Amy made lemonade for the refreshment of the whole party. Aunt March went today, for which, oh, be joyful, said Joe. I was mortally afraid she'd ask me to go with her. If she had, I should have felt as if I ought to do it. But Plumfield is about as gay as a churchyard, you know, and I'd rather be excused. We had a flurry getting the old lady off, and I had a fright every time she spoke to me, for I was in such a hurry to be through that I was uncommonly helpful and sweet, and feared she'd find it impossible to part from me. I quaked till she was fairly in the carriage, and had a final fright, for, as it drove off, she popped out her head, saying, Josie Fine, won't you? I didn't hear any more, for I basely turned and fled. I did actually run, and whisked round the corner where I felt safe. Poor old Joe. She came in looking as if bears were after her, said Beth, as she cuddled her sister's feet with a motherly air. Aunt March is a regular samphire, is she not? Observed Amy, tasting her mixture critically. She means vampire, not seaweed, but it doesn't matter. It's too warm to be particular about one's parts of speech, murmured Joe. What shall you do all your vacation? asked Amy, changing the subject with tact. I shall lie abed late and do nothing replied Meg from the depths of the rocking chair. I've been routed up early all winter and had to spend my days working for other people, so now I'm going to rest and revel to my heart's content. No, said Joe, that dozy way wouldn't suit me. I've laid in a heap of books, and I'm going to improve my shining hours reading on my perch in the old apple tree when I'm not having la- Don't say larks, implored Amy, as a return snub for the samphire correction. I'll say nightingales, then, with Lori. That's proper and appropriate, since he's a warbler. Don't let us do any lessons, Beth, for a while, but play all the time, and rest, as the girls mean to, proposed Amy. Well, I will, if Mother doesn't mind. I want to learn some new songs, and my children need fitting up for the summer. They are dreadfully out of order, and really suffering for clothes. May we, Mother? asked Meg, turning to Mrs. March who sat sewing in what they called Marmy's Corner. You may try your experiment for a week and see how you like it. I think by Saturday night you will find that all play and no work is as bad as all work and no play. Oh dear, no, it will be delicious, I'm sure, said Meg complacently. I now propose a toast as my friend and partner, Sari Gamp, says. Fun forever and no grubbing, cried Joe, rising, glass in hand, as the lemonade went round. They all drank it merrily, and began the experiment by lounging for the rest of the day. Next morning, Meg did not appear till ten o'clock. Her solitary breakfast did not taste nice, 
and the room seemed lonely and untidy. For Joe had not filled the vases, Beth had not dusted, and Amy's books lay scattered about. Nothing was neat and pleasant, but Marmy's corner, which looked as usual. And there Meg sat, to rest and read, which meant yawn, and imagine what pretty summer dresses she would get with her salary. Joe spent the morning on the river, with Lori, and the afternoon reading and crying over the wide, wide world up in the apple tree. Beth began by rummaging everything out of the big closet, where her family resided. But, getting tired before half done, she left her establishment topsy-turvy and went to her music, rejoicing that she had no dishes to wash. Amy arranged her bower, put on her best white frock, smoothed her curls, and sat down to draw under the honeysuckles, hoping someone would see and inquire who the young artist was. As no one appeared but an inquisitive daddy long legs, who examined her work with interest, she went to walk, got caught in a shower, and came home dripping. At tea time, they compared notes, and all agreed that it had been a delightful, though unusually, long day. Meg, who went shopping in the afternoon and got a sweet blue muslin, had discovered, after she had cut the breaths off, that it wouldn't wash, which mishap made her slightly cross. Joe had burnt the skin off her nose boating and got a raging headache by reading too long. Beth was worried by the confusion of her closet and the difficulty of learning three or four songs at once. And Amy deeply regretted the damage done her frock, for Katie Brown's party was to be the next day. And now, like Flora McFlimsy, she had nothing to wear. But these were mere trifles, and they assured their mother that the experiment was working finely. She smiled, said nothing, and, with Hannah's help, did their neglected work, keeping home pleasant and the domestic machinery running smoothly. It was astonishing what a peculiar and uncomfortable state of things was produced by the resting and reveling process. The days kept getting longer and longer, the weather was unusually variable, and so were tempers. An unsettled feeling possessed everyone, and Satan found plenty of mischief for the idle hands to do. As the height of luxury, Meg put out some of her sewing, and then found time hang so heavily that she fell to snipping and spoiling her clothes in her attempts to furbish them up a la mofa. Jo read till her eyes gave out, and she was sick of books, got so fidgety that even good-natured Lori had a quarrel with her, and so reduced in spirits that she desperately wished she had gone with Aunt March. Beth got on pretty well, for she was constantly forgetting that it was to be all play and no work, and fell back into her old ways now and then, but something in the air affected her, and more than once her tranquility was much disturbed. So much so, that on one occasion she actually shook poor dear Joanna, and told her she was a fright. Amy fared worst of all, for her resources were small, and when her sisters left her to amuse and care for herself, she soon found that accomplished and important little self a great burden. She didn't like dolls, fairy tales were childish, and one couldn't draw all the time. Tea parties didn't amount to much, neither did picnics, unless very well conducted. If one could have a fine house, full of nice girls, or go traveling, the summer would be delightful, but to stay at home with three selfish sisters and a grown-up boy was enough to try the patience of a Boaz, complained Miss Malaprop, after several days devoted to pleasure, fretting, and ennui. No one would own that they were tired of the experiment. But, by Friday night, each acknowledged to herself that she was glad the week was nearly done. Hoping to impress the lesson more deeply, Mrs. March, who had a good deal of humor, resolved to finish off the trial in an appropriate manner. So she gave Hannah a holiday and let the girls enjoy the full effect of the play system. When they got up on Saturday morning, there was no fire in the kitchen, no breakfast in the dining room, and no mother anywhere to be seen. Mercy on us! What has happened? cried Joe, staring about her in dismay. Meg ran upstairs and soon came back again, looking relieved, but rather bewildered and a little ashamed. Mother isn't sick, only very tired, and she says she is going to stay quietly in her room all day and let us do the best we can. It's a very queer thing for her to do. She doesn't act a bit like herself, but she says it has been a hard week for her, so we mustn't grumble, but take care of ourselves. That's easy enough, and I like the idea. I'm aching for something to do. That is, some new amusement, you know, added Joe quickly. In fact, it was an immense relief to them all to have a little work, and they took hold with a will, 
but soon realized the truth of Hannah's saying, housekeeping ain't no joke. There was plenty of food in the larder, and while Beth and Amy set the table, Meg and Joe got breakfast, wondering, as they did so, why servants ever talked about hard work. I shall take some up to mother, though she said we were not to think of her, for she'd take care of herself, said Meg, who presided, and felt quite matronly behind the teapot. So a tray was fitted out before anyone began, and taken up with the cook's compliments. The boiled tea was very bitter, the omelet scorched, and the biscuits speckled with saleratus. But Mrs. March received her repast with thanks, and laughed heartily over it after Joe was gone. Poor little souls! They will have a hard time, I'm afraid. But they won't suffer, and it will do them good, she said, producing the more palatable viands with which she had provided herself, and disposing of the bad breakfast so that their feelings might not be hurt. A motherly little deception, for which they were grateful. Many were the complaints below, and great the chagrin of the head cook at her failures. Never mind, I'll get the dinner and be servant. You be mistress, keep your hands nice, see company, and give orders, said Joe, who knew still less than Meg about culinary affairs. This obliging offer was gladly accepted, and Margaret retired to the parlor, which she hastily put in order by whisking the litter under the sofa and shutting the blinds to save the trouble of dusting. Joe, with perfect faith in her own powers and a friendly desire to make up the quarrel, immediately put a note in the office, inviting Lori to dinner. You'd better see what you have got before you think of having company, said Meg, when informed of the hospitable but rash act. Oh, there's corned beef and plenty of potatoes, and I shall get some asparagus and a lobster for a relish, as Hannah says. We'll have lettuce and make a salad. I don't know how, but the book tells. I'll have blanc mange and strawberries for dessert, and coffee, too, if you want to be elegant. Don't try too many messes, Joe, for you can't make anything but gingerbread and molasses candy fit to eat. I wash my hands of the dinner party, and since you have asked Lori on your own responsibility, you may just take care of him. I don't want you to do anything but be civil to him and help to the pudding. You'll give me your advice if I get in a muddle, won't you? Asked Joe, rather hurt. Yes, but I don't know much, except about bread and a few trifles. You had better ask mother's leave before you order anything, returned Meg prudently. Of course I shall. I'm not a fool. And Joe went off in a huff at the doubts expressed of her powers. Get what you like and don't disturb me. I'm going out to dinner and can't worry about things at home, said Mrs. March when Joe spoke to her. I never enjoyed housekeeping and I'm going to take a vacation today and read, write, go visiting and amuse myself. The unusual spectacle of her busy mother rocking comfortably and reading early in the morning made Joe feel as if some natural phenomenon had occurred, for an eclipse, an earthquake, or a volcanic eruption would hardly have seemed stranger. Everything is out of sorts somehow, she said to herself, going downstairs. There's Beth crying. That's a sure sign that something is wrong with this family. If Amy is bothering, I'll shake her. Feeling very much out of sorts herself, Joe hurried into the parlor to find Beth sobbing over Pip, the canary, who lay dead in the cage, with his little claws pathetically extended, as if imploring the food for want of which he had died. It's all my fault. I forgot him. There isn't a seed or a drop left. Oh, Pip! Oh, Pip! How could I be so cruel to you? cried Beth, taking the poor thing in her hands and trying to restore him. Joe peeped into his half-open eye, felt his little heart, and finding him stiff and cold, shook her head and offered her domino box for a coffin. Put him in the oven, and maybe he will get warm and revive, said Amy hopefully. He's been starved, and he shan't be baked, now he's dead. I'll make him a shroud, and he shall be buried in the garden, and I'll never have another bird, never my pip, for I am too bad to own one, murmured Beth, sitting on the floor with her pet folded in her hands. The funeral shall be this afternoon, and we will all go. Now, don't cry, Bethy. It's a pity, but nothing goes right this week, and Pip has had the worst of the experiment. Make the shroud and lay him in my box, and after the dinner party, we'll have a nice little funeral, said Joe, beginning to feel as if she had undertaken a good deal. Leaving the others to console Beth, she departed to the kitchen, which was in a most discouraging state of confusion. Putting on a big apron, she fell to work and got the dishes piled up ready for washing, 
when she discovered that the fire was out. Here's a sweet prospect, muttered Joe, slamming the stove door open and poking vigorously among the cinders. Having rekindled the fire, she thought she would go to market while the water heated. The walk revived her spirits, and, flattering herself that she had made good bargains, she trudged home again after buying a very young lobster, some very old asparagus, and two boxes of acid strawberries. By the time she got cleared up, the dinner arrived, and the stove was red hot. Hannah had left a pan of bread to rise. Meg had worked it up early, set it on the hearth for a second rising, and forgotten it. Meg was entertaining Sally Gardner in the parlor when the door flew open, and a flowery, crocky, flushed, and disheveled figure appeared, demanding tartly, I say, isn't bread riz enough when it runs over the pans? Sally began to laugh, but Meg nodded and lifted her eyebrows as high as they would go, which caused the apparition to vanish, and put the sour bread into the oven without further delay. Mrs. March went out, after peeping here and there to see how matters went, also saying a word of comfort to Beth, who sat making a winding sheet, while the deer departed lay in state in the domino box. A strange sense of helplessness fell upon the girls as the gray bonnet vanished round the corner, and despair seized them when, a few minutes later, Miss Crocker appeared and said she'd come to dinner. Now, this lady was a thin, yellow spinster, with a sharp nose and inquisitive eyes, who saw everything and gossiped about all she saw. They disliked her, but had been taught to be kind to her, simply because she was old and poor and had few friends. So Meg gave her the easy chair and tried to entertain her while she asked questions, criticized everything, and told stories of the people whom she knew. Language cannot describe the anxieties, experiences, and exertions which Joe underwent that morning, and the dinner she served up became a standing joke. Fearing to ask any more advice, she did her best alone, and discovered that something more than energy and goodwill is necessary to make a cook. She boiled the asparagus for an hour, and was grieved to find the heads cooked off, and the stalks harder than ever. The bread burnt black, for the salad dressing so aggravated her that she let everything else go till she had convinced herself that she could not make it fit to eat. The lobster was a scarlet mystery to her, but she hammered and poked till it was unshelled and its meager proportions concealed in a grove of lettuce leaves. The potatoes had to be hurried, not to keep the asparagus waiting, and were not done at last. The blank mange was lumpy, and the strawberries not as ripe as they looked, having been skillfully deaconed. Well, they can eat beef and bread and butter if they are hungry. Only it's mortifying to have to spend your whole morning for nothing, thought Joe, as she rang the bell half an hour later than usual, and stood, hot, tired, and dispirited, surveying the feast spread for Lori, accustomed to all sorts of elegance, and Miss Crocker, whose curious eyes would mark all failures, and whose tattling tongue would report them far and wide. Poor Joe would gladly have gone under the table, as one thing after another was tasted and left. While Amy giggled, Meg looked distressed, Miss Crocker pursed up her lips, and Laurie talked and laughed with all his might to give a cheerful tone to the festive scene. Joe's one strong point was the fruit, for she had sugared it well and had a pitcher of rich cream to eat with it. Her hot cheeks cooled a trifle, and she drew a long breath as the pretty glass plates went round, and everyone looked graciously at the little rosy islands floating in a sea of cream. Miss Crocker tasted first, made a wry face, and drank some water hastily. Joe, who had refused, thinking there might not be enough, for they dwindled sadly after the picking over, glanced at Lori, but he was eating away manfully, though there was a slight pucker about his mouth, and he kept his eye fixed on his plate. Amy, who was fond of delicate fare, took a heaping spoonful, choked, hid her face in her napkin, and left the table precipitately. Oh, what is it? exclaimed Joe, trembling. Salt instead of sugar, and the cream is sour, replied Meg, with a tragic gesture. Joe uttered a groan and fell back in her chair, remembering that she had given a last hasty powdering to the berries out of one of the two boxes on the kitchen table and had neglected to put the milk in the refrigerator. She turned scarlet and was on the verge of crying when she met Lori's eyes, which would look merry in spite of his heroic efforts. The comical side of the affair suddenly struck her and she laughed till the tears ran down her cheeks. So did everyone else, even Croker, as the girls called the old lady, and the unfortunate dinner ended gaily, 
with bread and butter, olives and fun. I haven't strength of mind enough to clear up now, so we will sober ourselves with a funeral, said Joe as they rose. And Miss Crocker made ready to go, being eager to tell the new story at another friend's dinner table. They did sober themselves, for Beth's sake. Lori dug a grave under the ferns in the grove. Little Pip was laid in, with many tears, by his tender-hearted mistress, and covered with moss, while a wreath of violets and chickweed was hung on the stone which bore his epitaph, composed by Joe, while she struggled with the dinner. Here lies Pip March, who died the 7th of June, loved and lamented sore, and not forgotten soon. At the conclusion of the ceremonies, Beth retired to her room, overcome with emotion and lobster, but there was no place of repose, for the beds were not made, and she found her grief much assuaged by beating up pillows and putting things in order. Meg helped Joe clear away the remains of the feast, which took half the afternoon, and left them so tired that they agreed to be contented with tea and toast for supper. Lori took Amy to drive, which was a deed of charity, for the sour cream seemed to have had a bad effect upon her temper. Mrs. March came home to find the three older girls hard at work in the middle of the afternoon, and a glance at the closet gave her an idea of the success of one part of the experiment. Before the housewives could rest, several people called, and there was a scramble to get ready to see them. Then tea must be got, errands done, and one or two necessary bits of sewing neglected till the last minute. As twilight fell, dewy and still, one by one they gathered in the porch where the June roses were budding beautifully, and each groaned or sighed as she sat down, as if tired or troubled. What a dreadful day this has been, begun Joe, usually the first to speak. It has seemed shorter than usual, but so uncomfortable, said Meg. Not a bit like home, added Amy. It can't seem so without Marmy and little Pip, sighed Beth, glancing with full eyes at the empty cage above her head. Here's mother, dear, and you shall have another bird tomorrow if you want it. As she spoke, Mrs. March came and took her place among them, looking as if her holiday had not been much pleasanter than theirs. Are you satisfied with your experiment, girls, or do you want another week of it? She asked, as Beth nestled up to her, and the rest turned toward her with brightening faces, as flowers turned toward the sun. I don't, cried Joe decidedly. Nor I, echoed the others. You think, then, that it is better to have a few duties and live a little for others, do you? Lounging and larking doesn't pay, observed Joe, shaking her head. I'm tired of it and mean to go to work at something right off. Suppose you learn plain cooking. That's a useful accomplishment, which no woman should be without, said Mrs. March, laughing inaudibly at the recollection of Joe's dinner party, for she had met Miss Crocker and heard her account of it. Mother, did you go away and let everything be, just to see how we'd get on? cried Meg, who had had suspicions all day. Yes, I wanted you to see how the comfort of all depends on each doing her share faithfully. While Hannah and I did your work, you got on pretty well, though I don't think you were very happy or amiable. So I thought, as a little lesson, I would show you what happens when everyone thinks only of herself. Don't you feel that it is pleasanter to help one another, to have daily duties which make leisure sweet when it comes, and to bear and forbear, that home may be comfortable and lovely to us all? We do, mother, we do, cried the girls. And then let me advise you to take up your little burdens again, for though they seem heavy sometimes, they are good for us and lighten as we learn to carry them. Work is wholesome, and there is plenty for everyone. It keeps us from ennui and mischief, is good for health and spirits, and gives us a sense of power and independence better than money or fashion. We'll work like bees, and love it too. See if we don't, said Joe. I'll learn plain cooking for my holiday task, and the next dinner party I have shall be a success. I'll make the set of shirts for father, instead of letting you do it, Marmy. I can and I will, though I'm not fond of sewing. That will be better than fussing over my own things, which are plenty nice enough as they are, said Meg. I'll do my lessons every day and not spend so much time with my music and dolls. I am a stupid thing and ought to be studying, not playing, was Beth's resolution. While Amy followed their example by heroically declaring, I shall learn to make buttonholes and attend to my parts of speech. Very good. Then I am quite satisfied with the experiment and fancy that we shall not have to repeat it, 
only don't go to the other extreme and delve like slaves. Have regular hours for work and play. Make each day both useful and pleasant, and prove that you understand the worth of time by employing it well. Then youth will be delightful, old age will bring few regrets, and life become a beautiful success, in spite of poverty. We'll remember, mother. And they did. 12. Camp Lawrence Beth was postmistress, for being most at home, she could attend to it regularly, and dearly liked the daily task of unlocking the little door and distributing the mail. One July day, she came in with her hands full and went about the house leaving letters and parcels, like the penny post. Here's your posy, mother. Lori never forgets that, she said, putting the fresh nosegay in the vase that stood in Marmy's corner and was kept supplied by the affectionate boy. Miss Meg March, one letter and a glove, continued Beth, delivering the articles to her sister, who sat near her mother, stitching wristbands. Why, I left a pair over there, and here is only one, said Meg, looking at the gray cotton glove. Didn't you drop the other in the garden? No, I'm sure I didn't, for there was only one in the office. I hate to have odd gloves. Never mind, the other may be found. My letter is only a translation of the German song I wanted. I think Mr. Brooke did it for this isn't Lori's writing. Mrs. March glanced at Meg, who was looking very pretty in her gingham morning gown with the little curls blowing about her forehead and very womanly as she sat sewing at her little work table full of tidy white rolls, so unconscious of the thought in her mother's mind as she sewed and sung while her fingers flew and her thoughts were busied with girlish fancies as innocent and fresh as the pansies in her belt, that Mrs. March smiled and was satisfied. Two letters for Dr. Joe, a book, and a funny old hat, which covered the whole post office, stuck outside, said Beth, laughing as she went into the study, where Joe sat writing. What a sly fellow Lori is. I said I wished bigger hats were the fashion, because I burn my face every hot day. He said, Why mind the fashion? Wear a big hat and be comfortable. I said I would if I had one, and he has sent me this, to try me. I'll wear it for fun, and show him I don't care for the fashion and, hanging the antique broad brim on a bust of Plato, Joe read her letters. One from her mother made her cheeks glow and her eyes fill, for it said to her, My dear, I write a little word to tell you with how much satisfaction I watch your efforts to control your temper. You say nothing about your trials, failures, or successes, and think, perhaps, that no one sees them but the friend whose help you daily ask if I may trust the well-worn cover of your guidebook. I, too, have seen them all, and heartily believe in the sincerity of your resolution, since it begins to bear fruit. Go on, dear, patiently and bravely, and always believe that no one sympathizes more tenderly with you than your loving. Mother, that does me good. That's worth millions of money and pecks of praise. Oh, Marmy, I do try. I will keep on trying and not get tired, since I have you to help me. Laying her head on her arms, Joe wet her little romance with a few happy tears, for she had thought that no one saw and appreciated her efforts to be good, and this assurance was doubly precious, doubly encouraging, because unexpected, and from the person whose commendation she most valued. Feeling stronger than ever to meet and subdue her Apollyon, she pinned the note inside her frock as a shield and a reminder, lest she be taken unaware, and proceeded to open her other letter, quite ready for either good or bad news. In a big, dashing hand, Lori wrote, Dear Joe, what ho! Some English girls and boys are coming to see me tomorrow, and I want to have a jolly time. If it's fine, I'm going to pitch my tent in Longmeadow and row up the whole crew to lunch and croquet, have a fire, make messes, gypsy fashion, and all sorts of larks. They are nice people, and like such things. Brooke will go, to keep us boys steady, and Kate Vaughn will play propriety for the girls. I want you all to come, can't let Beth off at any price, and nobody shall worry her. Don't bother about rations. I'll see to that and everything else. Only do come. There's a good fellow. In a tearing hurry, yours ever, Lori. Here's richness, cried Joe, flying in to tell the news to Meg. Of course we can go, Mother. It will be such a help to Lori, for I can row, and Meg see to the lunch, and the children be useful in some way. I hope the Vaughns are not fine grown-up people. Do you know anything about them, Joe? asked Meg. Only that there are four of them. Kate is older than you, Fred and Frank, twins, about my age, and a little girl, Grace, who
who was nine or ten. Lori knew them abroad and liked the boys. I fancied, from the way he primmed up his mouth in speaking of her, that he didn't admire Kate much. I'm so glad my French print is clean. It's just the thing, and so becoming, observed Meg complacently. Have you anything decent, Joe? Scarlet and gray boating suit, good enough for me. I shall row and tramp about, so I don't want any starch to think of. You'll come, Bethy? If you won't let any of the boys talk to me. Not a boy. I like to please Lori, and I'm not afraid of Mr. Brooke. He is so kind. But I don't want to play or sing or say anything. I'll work hard and not trouble anyone, and you'll take care of me, Joe, so I'll go. That's my good girl. You do try to fight off your shyness, and I love you for it. Fighting faults isn't easy, as I know, and a cheery word kind of gives a lift. Thank you, mother. And Joe gave the thin cheek a grateful kiss, more precious to Mrs. March than if it had given back the rosy roundness of her youth. I had a box of chocolate drops and the picture I wanted to copy, said Amy, showing her mail. And I got a note from Mr. Lawrence, asking me to come over and play to him tonight, before the lamps are lighted and I shall go, added Beth, whose friendship with the old gentleman prospered finally. Now let's fly round and do double duty today so that we can play tomorrow with free minds, said Joe, preparing to replace her pen with a broom. When the sun peeped into the girls' room early next morning to promise them a fine day, he saw a comical sight. Each had made such preparation for the fate as seemed necessary and proper. Meg had an extra row of little curl papers across her forehead. Joe had copiously anointed her afflicted face with cold cream. Beth had taken Joanna to bed with her to atone for the approaching separation, and Amy had capped the climax by putting a clothespin on her nose to uplift the offending feature. It was one of the kind artists used to hold the paper on their drawing boards, therefore quite appropriate and effective for the purpose to which it was now put. This funny spectacle appeared to amuse the son, for he burst out with such radiance that Joe woke up and roused all her sisters by a hearty laugh at Amy's ornament. Sunshine and laughter were good omens for a pleasure party, and soon a lively bustle began in both houses. Beth, who was ready first, kept reporting what went on next door, and enlivened her sister's toilets by frequent telegrams from the window. There goes the man with the tent. I see Mrs. Barker doing up the lunch in a hamper and a great basket. Now Mr. Lawrence is looking up at the sky and the weathercock. I wish he would go too. There's Lori, looking like a sailor. Nice boy. Oh, mercy me. Here's a carriage full of people, a tall lady, a little girl, and two dreadful boys. One is lame. Poor thing, he's got a crutch. Lori didn't tell us that. Be quick, girls, it's getting late. Why, there is Ned Moffat, I do declare. Look, Meg, isn't that the man who bowed to you one day when we were shopping? So it is. How queer that he should come. I thought he was at the mountains. There is Sally. I'm glad she got back in time. Am I all right, Joe? cried Meg in a flutter. A regular daisy. Hold up your dress and put your hat straight. It looks sentimental tipped that way and will fly off at the first puff. Now then, come on. Oh, Joe, you are not going to wear that awful hat? It's too absurd. You shall not make a guy of yourself, remonstrated Meg, as Joe tied down with a red ribbon the broad-brimmed old-fashioned leghorn lorry had sent for a joke. I just will, though, for it's capital. So shady, light, and big. It will make fun, and I don't mind being a guy if I'm comfortable. With that, Joe marched straight away, and the rest followed, a bright little band of sisters, all looking their best, in summer suits, with happy faces under the jaunty hat brims. Lori ran to meet, and present them to his friends in the most cordial manner. The lawn was the reception room, and for several minutes a lively scene was enacted there. Meg was grateful to see that Miss Kate, though twenty, was dressed with a simplicity which American girls would do well to imitate and she was much flattered by Mr. Ned's assurances that he came especially to see her. Joe understood why Lori primmed up his mouth when speaking of Kate, for that young lady had a standoff don't touch me air, which contrasted strongly with the free and easy demeanor of the other girls. Beth took an observation of the new boys and decided that the lame one was not dreadful, but gentle and feeble, and she would be kind to him on that account. Amy found Grace a well-mannered, merry little person, 
and after staring dumbly at one another for a few minutes, they suddenly became very good friends. Tents, lunch, and croquet utensils having been sent on beforehand, the party was soon embarked, and the two boats pushed off together, leaving Mr. Lawrence waving his hat on the shore. Lori and Joe rowed one boat, Mr. Brooke and Ned the other, while Fred Vaughn, the riotous twin, did his best to upset both by paddling about in a wherry like a disturbed water bug. Joe's funny hat deserved a vote of thanks, for it was of general utility. It broke the ice in the beginning by producing a laugh. It created quite a refreshing breeze, flapping to and fro as she rode and would make an excellent umbrella for the whole party. If a shower came up, she said. Kate looked rather amazed at Joe's proceedings, especially as she exclaimed, Christopher Columbus, when she lost her oar. And Lori said, My dear fellow, did I hurt you? when he tripped over her feet in taking his place. But after putting up her glass to examine the queer girl several times, Miss Kate decided that she was odd, but rather clever, and smiled upon her from afar. Meg, in the other boat, was delightfully situated, face to face with the rowers, who both admired the prospect and feathered their oars with uncommon skill and dexterity. Mr. Brooke was a grave, silent young man with handsome brown eyes and a pleasant voice. Meg liked his quiet manners and considered him a walking encyclopedia of useful knowledge. He never talked to her much, but he looked at her a good deal, and she felt sure that he did not regard her with aversion. Ned, being in college, of course put on all the airs which freshmen think it their bounden duty to assume. He was not very wise, but very good-natured, and altogether an excellent person to carry on a picnic. Sally Gardner was absorbed in keeping her white pique dress clean and chattering with the ubiquitous Fred, who kept Beth in constant terror by his pranks. It was not far to Longmeadow, but the tent was pitched and the wickets down by the time they arrived. A pleasant green field with three wide-spreading oaks in the middle and a smooth strip of turf for croquet. "'Welcome to Camp Lawrence,' said the young host as they landed with exclamations of delight. "'Brooke is commander-in-chief. I am commissary general. The other fellows are staff officers, and you ladies are company. The tent is for your especial benefit, and that oak is your drawing room. This is the mess room, and the third is the camp kitchen. Now let's have a game before it gets hot, and then we'll see about dinner. Frank, Beth, Amy, and Grace sat down to watch the game played by the other eight. Mr. Brooke chose Meg, Kate, and Fred. Lori took Sally, Joe, and Ned. The Englishers played well, but the Americans played better and contested every inch of the ground as strongly as if the spirit of 76 inspired them. Joe and Fred had several skirmishes and once narrowly escaped high words. Joe was through the last wicket and had missed the stroke, which failure ruffled her a good deal. Fred was close behind her, and his turn came before hers. He gave a stroke, his ball hit the wicket, and stopped an inch on the wrong side. No one was very near, and running up to examine, he gave it a sly nudge with his toe, which put it just an inch on the right side. "'I'm through. Now, Miss Joe, I'll settle you and get in first, cried the young gentleman, swinging his mallet for another blow. "'You pushed it. I saw you. It's my turn now,' said Joe sharply. "'Upon my word, I didn't move it. It rolled a bit, perhaps, but that is allowed. So stand off, please, and let me have a go at the stake.' We don't cheat in America, but you can if you choose, said Joe angrily. Yankees are a deal the most tricky, everybody knows. There you go, returned Fred, croqueting her ball far away. Joe opened her lips to say something rude, but checked herself in time, colored up to her forehead, and stood a minute, hammering down a wicket with all her might, while Fred hit the stake and declared himself out with much exultation. She went off to get her ball and was a long time finding it among the bushes but she came back, looking cool and quiet, and waited her turn patiently. It took several strokes to regain the place she had lost, and, when she got there, the other side had nearly won, for Kate's ball was the last but one, and lay near the stake. "'By George, it's all up with us! Goodbye, Kate! Miss Joe owes me one, so you are finished!' cried Fred excitedly, as they all drew near to see the finish. "'Yankees have a trick of being generous to their enemies,' said Joe, with a look that made the lad redden, especially when they beat them, she added, as, leaving Kate's ball untouched, she won the game by a clever stroke. 
Lori threw up his hat, then remembered that it wouldn't do to exult over the defeat of his guests, and stopped in the middle of a cheer to whisper to his friend, Good for you, Joe. He did cheat. I saw him. We can't tell him so, but he won't do it again. Take my word for it. Meg drew her aside, under pretense of pinning up a loose braid, and said approvingly, It was dreadfully provoking. But you kept your temper, and I'm so glad, Joe. Don't praise me, Meg, for I could box his ears this minute. I should certainly have boiled over if I hadn't stayed among the nettles till I got my rage under enough to hold my tongue. It's simmering now, so I hope he'll keep out of my way, returned Joe, biting her lips, as she glowered at Fred from under her big hat. Time for lunch, said Mr. Brooke, looking at his watch. Commissary General, will you make the fire and get water, while Miss March, Miss Sally, and I spread the table? Who can make good coffee? Joe can, said Meg, glad to recommend her sister. So Joe, feeling that her late lessons in cookery were to do her honor, went to preside over the coffee pot, while the children collected dry sticks, and the boys made a fire and got water from a spring nearby. Miss Kate sketched, and Frank talked to Beth, who was making little mats of braided rushes to serve as plates. The commander-in-chief and his aides soon spread the tablecloth with an inviting array of eatables and drinkables, prettily decorated with green leaves. Joe announced that the coffee was ready, and everyone settled themselves to a hearty meal. For youth is seldom dyspeptic, and exercise develops wholesome appetites. A very merry lunch it was, for everything seemed fresh and funny, and frequent peals of laughter startled a venerable horse who fed nearby. There was a pleasing inequality in the table, which produced many mishaps to cups and plates. Acorns dropped into the milk, little black ants partook of the refreshments without being invited, and fuzzy caterpillars swung down from the tree to see what was going on. Three white-headed children peeped over the fence, and an objectionable dog barked at them from the other side of the river with all his might and mane. There's salt here, if you prefer it, said Lori, as he handed Joe a saucer of berries. Thank you, I prefer spiders, she replied, fishing up two unwary little ones who had gone to a creamy death. How dare you remind me of that horrid dinner party when yours is so nice in every way, added Joe, as they both laughed and ate out of one plate, the china having run short. I had an uncommonly good time that day and haven't got over it yet. This is no credit to me, you know. I don't do anything. It's you and Meg and Brooke who make it go, and I'm no end obliged to you. What shall we do when we can't eat any more? asked Lori, feeling that his trump card had been played when lunch was over. Have games till it's cooler. I brought authors, and I dare say Miss Kate knows something new and nice. Go and ask her. She's company, and you ought to stay with her more. Aren't you company, too? I thought she'd suit Brooke, but he keeps talking to Meg, and Kate just stares at them through that ridiculous glass of hers. I'm going, so you needn't try to preach propriety, for you can't do it, Joe. Miss Kate did know several new games, and as the girls would not, and the boys could not, eat any more, they all adjourned to the drawing room to play rigmarole. One person begins a story, any nonsense you like, and tells as long as he pleases, only taking care to stop short at some exciting point when the next takes it up and does the same. It's very funny when well done, and makes a perfect jumble of tragical comical stuff to laugh over. Please start it, Mr. Brooke, said Kate, with a commanding air, which surprised Meg, who treated the tutor with as much respect as any other gentleman. Lying on the grass at the feet of the two young ladies, Mr. Brooke obediently began the story, with the handsome brown eyes steadily fixed upon the sunshiny river. Once on a time, a knight went out into the world to seek his fortune, for he had nothing but his sword and his shield. He traveled a long while, nearly eight and twenty years, and had a hard time of it, till he came to the palace of a good old king, who had offered a reward to anyone who would tame and train a fine but unbroken colt, of which he was very fond. The knight agreed to try, and got on slowly but surely, for the colt was a gallant fellow, and soon learned to love his new master, though he was freakish and wild. Every day, when he gave his lessons to this pet of the king's, the knight rode him through the city, and, as he rode, he looked everywhere for a certain beautiful face, which he had seen many times in his dreams, but never found. One day, as he went prancing down a quiet street, he saw at the window of a ruinous castle the lovely face. He was delighted, 
inquired who lived in this old castle, and was told that several captive princesses were kept there by a spell, and spun all day to lay up money to buy their liberty. The knight wished intensely that he could free them, but he was poor and could only go by each day, watching for the sweet face and longing to see it out in the sunshine. At last, he resolved to get into the castle and ask how he could help them. He went and knocked, the great door flew open, and he beheld a ravishingly lovely lady who exclaimed with a cry of rapture, At last, at last, continued Kate, who had read French novels and admired the style. Tis she, cried Count Gustave, and fell at her feet in an ecstasy of joy. Oh, rise, she said, extending a hand of marble fairness. Never, till you tell me how I may rescue you, swore the knight, still kneeling. Alas, my cruel fate condemns me to remain here till my tyrant is destroyed. Where is the villain? In the Mauve Salon. Go, brave heart, and save me from despair. I obey, and return victorious or dead. With these thrilling words, he rushed away, and flinging open the door of the Mauve Salon, was about to enter when he received a stunning blow from the big Greek lexicon, which an old fellow in a black gown fired at him, said Ned. Instantly, sir, what's-his-name recovered himself, pitched the tyrant out of the window, and turned to join the lady, victorious, but with a bump on his brow. Found the door locked, tore up the curtains, made a rope ladder, got halfway down when the ladder broke, and he went head first into the moat, sixty feet below. Could swim like a duck, paddled round the castle till he came to a little door guarded by two stout fellows, knocked their heads together till they cracked like a couple of nuts, then by a trifling exertion of his prodigious strength, he smashed in the door, went up a pair of stone steps covered with dust, a foot thick, toads as big as your fist, and spiders that would frighten you into hysterics, Miss March. At the top of these steps, he came plump upon a sight that took his breath away and chilled his blood. A tall figure, all in white with a veil over its face and a lamp in its wasted hand, went on Meg. It beckoned, gliding noiselessly before him down a corridor as dark and cold as any tomb. Shadowy effigies in armor stood on either side. A dead silence reigned, the lamp burned blue, and the ghostly figure ever and anon turned its face toward him, showing the glitter of awful eyes through its white veil. They reached a curtained door, behind which sounded lovely music. He sprang forward to enter, but the specter plucked him back and waved threateningly before him a Snuff box, said Joe, in a sepulchral tone, which convulsed the audience. Thank ye, said the knight politely, as he took a pinch, and sneezed seven times so violently that his head fell off. Ha! Ha! laughed the ghost, and having peeped through the keyhole at the princesses spinning away for dear life, the evil spirit picked up her victim and put him in a large tin box, where there were eleven other knights packed together without their heads, like sardines who all rose and began to dance a hornpipe, cut in Fred, as Joe paused for breath. And as they danced, the rubbishy old castle turned to a man of war in full sail. Up with the jib, reef the topsail halyards, helm hard a lee, and man the guns, roared the captain, as a Portuguese pirate hove in sight, with a flag black as ink flying from her foremast. Go in and win, my hearties, says the captain, and a tremendous fight begun. Of course the British beat. They always do. No, they don't, cried Joe aside. Having taken the pirate captain prisoner, sailed slap over the schooner, whose decks were piled with dead and whose lee scuppers ran blood, for the order had been cutlasses and die hard. Bosun's mate, take a bite of the flying jib sheet and start this villain if he don't confess his sins double quick, said the British captain. The Portuguese held his tongue like a brick and walked the plank, while the jolly tars cheered like mad. But the sly dog dived, came up under the man-of-war, scuttled her, and down she went, with all sail set, to the bottom of the sea, 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 where— "'Oh, gracious! What shall I say?' cried Sally, as Fred ended his rigmarole, in which he had jumbled together, pell-mell, nautical phrases and facts, out of one of his favorite books. Well, they went to the bottom, and a nice mermaid welcomed them, but was much grieved on finding the box of headless knights— and kindly pickled them in brine, hoping to discover the mystery about them, for, being a woman, she was curious. By and by a diver came down, and the mermaid said, 
I'll give you this box of pearls if you can take it up. For she wanted to restore the poor things to life, and couldn't raise the heavy load herself. So the diver hoisted it up, and was much disappointed on opening it to find no pearls. He left it in a great lonely field, where it was found by a, ah, little goose girl who kept a hundred fat geese in the field, said Amy, when Sally's invention gave out. The little girl was sorry for them, and asked an old woman what she should do to help them. Your geese will tell you, they know everything, said the old woman. So she asked what she should use for new heads, since the old ones were lost, and all the geese opened their hundred mouths and screamed, Cabbages, continued Lori promptly. Just the thing, said the girl, and ran to get twelve fine ones from her garden. She put them on, the knights revived at once, thanked her, and went on their way rejoicing, never knowing the difference, for there were so many other heads like them in the world that no one thought anything of it. The knight in whom I'm interested went back to find the pretty face, and learned that the princesses had spun themselves free and all gone to be married, but one. He was in a great state of mind at that, and mounting the colt, who stood by him through thick and thin, rushed to the castle to see which was left. Peeping over the hedge, he saw the queen of his affections picking flowers in her garden. "'Will you give me a rose?' said he. "'You must come and get it. I can't come to you. It isn't proper,' said she, as sweet as honey. He tried to climb over the hedge, but it seemed to grow higher and higher. Then he tried to push through, but it grew thicker and thicker, and he was in despair. So he patiently broke twig after twig, till he had made a little hole, through which he peeped, saying imploringly, Let me in! Let me in! But the pretty princess did not seem to understand, for she picked her roses quietly and left him to fight his way in. Whether he did or not, Frank will tell you. I can't. I'm not playing. I never do, said Frank, dismayed at the sentimental predicament out of which he was to rescue the absurd couple. Beth had disappeared behind Joe, and Grace was asleep. So the poor knight is to be left sticking in the hedge, is he? asked Mr. Brooke, still watching the river and playing with the wild rose in his buttonhole. I guess the princess gave him a posy and opened the gate after a while, said Lori, smiling to himself as he threw acorns at his tutor. What a piece of nonsense we have made. With practice, we might do something quite clever. Do you know truth? asked Sally, after they had laughed over their story. I hope so, said Meg soberly. The game, I mean? What is it? said Fred. Why, you pile up your hands, choose a number, and draw out in turn, and the person who draws at the number has to answer truly any questions put by the rest. It's great fun. Let's try it, said Joe, who liked new experiments. Miss Kate and Mr. Brooke, Meg and Ned declined, but Fred, Sally, Joe, and Lori piled and drew, and the lot fell to Lori. Who are your heroes? asked Joe. Grandfather and Napoleon. Which lady here do you think prettiest? said Sally. Margaret. Which do you like best? from Fred. Joe, of course. What silly questions you ask! And Joe gave a disdainful shrug as the rest laughed at Lori's matter-of-fact tone. Try again. Truth isn't a bad game, said Fred. It's a very good one for you, retorted Joe in a low voice. Her turn came next. What is your greatest fault? asked Fred, by way of testing in her the virtue he lacked himself. A quick temper. What do you most wish for? said Lori. A pair of bootlacings, returned Joe, guessing and defeating his purpose. Not a true answer. You must say what you really do want most. Genius. Don't you wish you could give it to me, Lori? And she slyly smiled in his disappointed face. What virtues do you most admire in a man? asked Sally. Courage and honesty. Now my turn, said Fred, as his hand came last. Let's give it to him, whispered Lori to Joe, who nodded and asked at once. Didn't you cheat at croquet? Well, yes, a little bit. Good. Didn't you take your story out of the sea lion? said Lori. Rather. Don't you think the English nation perfect in every respect? asked Sally. I should be ashamed of myself if I didn't. He's a true John Bull. Now, Miss Sally, you shall have a chance without waiting to draw. I'll harrow up your feelings first, by asking if you don't think you are something of a flirt, said Lori, as Joe nodded to Fred, as a sign that peace was declared. You impertinent boy, of course I'm not, exclaimed Sally, with an air that proved the contrary. 
What do you hate most? asked Fred. Spiders and rice pudding. What do you like best? asked Joe. Dancing in French gloves. Well, I think truth is a very silly play. Let's have a sensible game of authors to refresh our minds, proposed Joe. Ned, Frank, and the little girls joined in this, and, while it went on, the three elders sat apart, talking. Miss Kate took out her sketch again, and Margaret watched her, while Mr. Brook lay on the grass, with a book which he did not read. How beautifully you do it! I wish I could draw, said Meg, with mingled admiration and regret in her voice. Why don't you learn? I should think you had taste and talent for it, replied Miss Kate graciously. I haven't time. Your mama prefers other accomplishments, I fancy. So did mine. But I proved to her that I had talent by taking a few lessons privately, and then she was quite willing I should go on. Can't you do the same with your governess? I have none. I forgot. Young ladies in America go to school more than with us. Very fine schools they are, too, Papa says. You go to a private one, I suppose. I don't go at all. I am a governess myself. Oh, indeed, said Miss Kate. But she might as well have said, Dear me, how dreadful! For her tone implied it, and something in her face made Meg color and wish she had not been so frank. Mr. Brooke looked up and said quickly, Young ladies in America love independence as much as their ancestors did and are admired and respected for supporting themselves. Oh, yes. Of course it's very nice and proper in them to do so. We have many most respectable and worthy young women who do the same and are employed by the nobility, because, being the daughters of gentlemen, they are both well-bred and accomplished, you know, said Miss Kate, in a patronizing tone that hurt Meg's pride, and made her work seem not only more distasteful, but degrading. Did the German song suit, Miss March? inquired Mr. Brooke, breaking an awkward pause. Oh, yes! It was very sweet, and I'm much obliged to whoever translated it for me. And Meg's downcast face brightened as she spoke. Don't you read German? asked Miss Kate, with a look of surprise. Not very well. My father, who taught me, is away, and I don't get on very fast alone, for I've no one to correct my pronunciation. Try a little now. Here is Schiller's Mary Stuart, and a tutor who loves to teach. And Mr. Brooke laid his book on her lap with an inviting smile. It's so hard I'm afraid to try, said Meg, grateful, but bashful in the presence of the accomplished young lady beside her. I'll read a bit to encourage you. And Miss Kate read one of the most beautiful passages in a perfectly correct but perfectly expressionless manner. Mr. Brooke made no comment as she returned the book to Meg, who said innocently, I thought it was poetry. Some of it is. Try this passage. There was a queer smile about Mr. Brooke's mouth as he opened at poor Mary's lament. Meg, obediently following the long grass blade which her new tutor used to point with, read slowly and timidly, unconsciously making poetry of the hard words by the soft intonation of her musical voice. Down the page went the green guide, and presently, forgetting her listener in the beauty of the sad scene, Meg read as if alone, giving a little touch of tragedy to the words of the unhappy queen. If she had seen the brown eyes then, she would have stopped short. But she never looked up, and the lesson was not spoiled for her. Very well indeed said Mr. Brooke, as she paused, quite ignoring her many mistakes, and looking as if he did, indeed, love to teach. Miss Kate put up her glass, and having taken a survey of the little tableau before her, shut her sketchbook, saying, with condescension, You've a nice accent, and, in time, will be a clever reader. I advise you to learn, for German is a valuable accomplishment to teachers. I must look after Grace, she is romping. And Miss Kate strolled away, adding to herself with a shrug. I didn't come to chaperone a governess, though she is young and pretty. What odd people these Yankees are. I'm afraid Lori will be quite spoilt among them. I forgot that English people rather turn up their noses at governesses and don't treat them as we do, said Meg, looking after the retreating figure with an annoyed expression. Tutors also have rather a hard time of it there, as I know to my sorrow. There's no place like America for us workers, Miss Margaret. And Mr. Brooke looked so contented and cheerful that Meg was ashamed to lament her hard lot. I'm glad I live in it, then. I don't like my work, but I get a good deal of satisfaction out of it after all, so I won't complain. I only wish I liked teaching as you do. 
I think you would if you had Lori for a pupil. I shall be very sorry to lose him next year, said Mr. Brooke, busily punching holes in the turf. Going to college, I suppose. Meg's lips asked that question, but her eyes added, And what becomes of you? Yes, it's high time he went, for he is ready, and as soon as he is off, I shall turn soldier. I am needed. I am glad of that, exclaimed Meg. I should think every young man would want to go, though it is hard for the mothers and sisters who stay at home, she added sorrowfully. I have neither, and very few friends, to care whether I live or die, said Mr. Brooke, rather bitterly, as he absently put the dead rose in the hole he had made and covered it up, like a little grave. Lori and his grandfather would care a great deal, and we should all be very sorry to have any harm happen to you, said Meg heartily. Thank you, that sounds pleasant, began Mr. Brooke, looking cheerful again. But before he could finish his speech, Ned, mounted on the old horse, came lumbering up to display his equestrian skill before the young ladies, and there was no more quiet that day. Don't you love to ride? asked Grace of Amy, as they stood resting, after a race round the field with the others, led by Ned. I dote upon it. My sister Meg used to ride when Papa was rich, but we don't keep any horses now except Ellen Tree, added Amy, laughing. Tell me about Ellen Tree. Is it a donkey? asked Grace curiously. Why, you see, Joe is crazy about horses, and so am I, but we've only got an old side saddle and no horse. Out in our garden is an apple tree that has a nice low branch, so Joe put the saddle on it, fixed some reins on the part that turns up, and we bounce away on Ellen Tree whenever we like. How funny, laughed Grace. I have a pony at home and ride nearly every day in the park with Fred and Kate. It's very nice, for my friends go too, and the row is full of ladies and gentlemen. Dear, how charming. I hope I shall go abroad some day, but I'd rather go to Rome than the row, said Amy who had not the remotest idea what the row was and wouldn't have asked for the world. Frank, sitting just behind the little girls, heard what they were saying and pushed his crutch away from him with an impatient gesture as he watched the active lads going through all sorts of comical gymnastics. Beth, who was collecting the scattered author cards, looked up and said, in her shy yet friendly way, I'm afraid you are tired. Can I do anything for you? Talk to me, please. It's dull, sitting by myself, answered Frank, who had evidently been used to being made much of at home. If he had asked her to deliver a Latin oration, it would not have seemed a more impossible task to bashful Beth. But there was no place to run to, no Joe to hide behind now, and the poor boy looked so wistfully at her that she bravely resolved to try. What do you like to talk about? she asked, fumbling over the cards and dropping half as she tried to tie them up. Well... I like to hear about cricket and boating and hunting, said Frank, who had not yet learned to suit his amusements to his strength. My heart, what shall I do? I don't know anything about them, thought Beth. And forgetting the boy's misfortune in her flurry, she said, hoping to make him talk, I never saw any hunting, but I suppose you know all about it. I did once, but I can never hunt again, for I got hurt leaping a confounded five-barred gate, so there are no more horses and hounds for me said Frank, with a sigh that made Beth hate herself for her innocent blunder. Your deer are much prettier than our ugly buffaloes, she said, turning to the prairies for help, and feeling glad that she had read one of the boy's books in which Joe delighted. Buffaloes proved soothing and satisfactory, and, in her eagerness to amuse another, Beth forgot herself and was quite unconscious of her sister's surprise and delight at the unusual spectacle of Beth talking away to one of the dreadful boys, against whom she had begged protection. "'Bless her heart! She pities him, so she is good to him,' said Joe, beaming at her from the croquet ground. "'I always said she was a little saint,' added Meg, as if there could be no further doubt of it. "'I haven't heard Frank laugh so much for ever so long,' said Grace to Amy, as they sat discussing dolls and making tea sets out of the acorn cups. "'My sister Beth is a very fastidious girl when she likes to be,' said Amy, well pleased at Beth's success." She meant fascinating, but as Grace didn't know the exact meaning of either word, fastidious sounded well and made a good impression. An impromptu circus, fox and geese, and an amicable game of croquet finished the afternoon. At sunset, the tent was struck, hampers packed, wickets pulled up, boats loaded, and the whole party floated down the river, singing at the tops of their voices. 
Ned, getting sentimental, warbled a serenade with the pensive refrain, Alone, alone, ah, woe, alone. And at the lines, We each are young, we each have a heart, oh, why should we stand thus coldly apart? He looked at Meg with such a lackadaisical expression that she laughed outright and spoiled his song. How can you be so cruel to me? he whispered, under cover of a lively chorus. You've kept close to that starched-up Englishwoman all day, and now you snub me. I didn't mean to, but you looked so funny I really couldn't help it, replied Meg, passing over the first part of his reproach. For it was quite true that she had shunned him, remembering the Moffat party and the talk after it. Ned was offended and turned to Sally for consolation, saying to her rather pettishly, There isn't a bit of flirt in that girl, is there? Not a particle, but she's a dear, returned Sally, defending her friend even while confessing her shortcomings. She's not a stricken dear anyway, said Ned, trying to be witty and succeeding as well as very young gentlemen usually do. On the lawn, where it had gathered, the little party separated with cordial goodnights and goodbyes for the Vaughns were going to Canada. As the four sisters went home through the garden, Miss Kate looked after them, saying, without the patronizing tone in her voice, In spite of their demonstrative manners, American girls are very nice when one knows them. I quite agree with you, said Mr. Brooke. And that concludes our exploration of chapters 10, 11, and 12 of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. Through the delightful antics of the March Sisters' secret clubs, their heartfelt experiments in self-improvement, and the joyous moments at Camp Lawrence, we've journeyed further into the heart of this classic tale. Each chapter of Little Women brings us closer to understanding the universal themes of growth, friendship, and the simple pleasures of life. Alcott's timeless narrative continues to enchant and inspire, reminding us of the enduring power of literature. If you've enjoyed this journey, Remember to subscribe to Obsidian River Productions for more episodes that bring classic literature to life. Your support helps keep these timeless stories alive and accessible to all. Before we part, don't forget to visit obsidianriver.com gift to download your free audiobook. It's a small token of appreciation for being part of this literary adventure. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned for more chapters from Little Women and other classic tales. Keep the spirit of literature thriving in your hearts and minds.